Go ahead and open your Bibles to Psalm 63. Psalm 63. Familiar phrases and passages in the scripture, usually they're familiar to us because we've heard them in song before. Is one that comes from Psalm 42, verse 1. I'm going to put your ribbon there, Psalm 63. We'll meet there in a minute. But it says, as the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. Of course, that's King James Version. We know that to be the song, as the deer pants for the water. Psalm 84, verse 2 says, my heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. So there's this longing for and this calling out to and crying out for God and His presence in our lives. Do we desire God this much? Answer that question for yourself. I, I'm not, I can't answer it for you. I can only answer it for myself. Do we desire God that much? Like water in the desert. Can you imagine being in a desert, being there for some time and having no water? What about air if you're drowning? How, how important would air be to you? Or food in the time of famine? These are ways that we're told in the Scripture. We look at Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, they shall be filled. But you've got a hunger and thirst. Like, do, do we desire God that much? You look at 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 9, David saying to his son, If thou seek him, he will be found of thee, but if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. But notice the condition that if you seek him, when we consider this psalm that I told you to turn to, Psalm 63, I want to look at verses 1 through 6 our study together today. We're going to see how the child of God lives. A child of God lives better than life. Not just life. Better than life. And you may think, okay, well, the New Testament says something about that. Jesus came into this world for a purpose, and that was a purpose of giving us a more abundant life. The thief, this is John 10, verse 10. The thief comes to steal, to kill, to destroy. I came that you might have life. Not just any life, though. An abundant life. An overflowing life. So as we think about life, and I think about those first things that I ask myself as I ask you, do we seek God, do we long for God that much in our lives? Do we live better than life as his people? First thing I want you to consider is verses 1 and 2. Living better than life, we're going to be devoted to God. We're going to have this devotion to God. Look at Psalm 63, verse 1. O God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. To see thy power and thy glory so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. O God, thou art my God. Another song we sometimes sing. O God, you are my God. And I will ever praise you. Beautiful words but a more powerful statement of fact, if it's true. Is God your God? Do you seek Him that much? Can you honestly say He is your God? Psalm 143 in verse 10 says, Teach me to do Thy will. Why? For Thou art, notice again the personal connection here, Thou art my God. There, there was a time in Barry Kennedy's life where God was the God of Larry and Jerry. Now, now hear me what I'm saying. I'm thankful for that. But Barry's God was the God of Larry and Sherry Kennedy. As I matured and as I grew and as I learned and as I got to know God by faith through the Scripture, He became my God. I'm sure there's a time in three young people's lives where God was the God of Barry and Berta Kennedy. But Barry and Berta Kennedy also taught those children to make God their God. Not make my faith their faith. Make the faith their faith. Same idea. That's my role as a parent. That's my job as God's child. My God. That's a powerful statement. Not some flippant euphemism as our world has demeaned it to be. My God is a powerful statement. that need not be taken flippantly or lightly. And it starts with understanding that devotion concept. He is ours by covenant and our consent. 
He is ours by covenant. That's a, a legal term, but also by our consent. Look with me at a couple of passages in Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10. He says, For this is the covenant, that's that agreement, that I will make with them, with the house of Israel, after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. This is uh, the revealing of that prophecy that was made by Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31, 31 following. It's word for word verbatim. This is what came about in the new system, the new covenant, the new testament, the law of Christ. I'll be to them a God. It's not going to be like the covenant I made with their, with their fathers on the other side. No, it's not like that covenant. They broke that covenant. That's the law of Moses. This one I'm going to write in their hearts. It's by covenant, by agreement of God. But go back to John chapter 6. John chapter 6, and look at verses 67 and 68. This is where the consent comes into play. Because Jesus came to establish that new covenant, that new law, and those first that he came to, those closest to him, his disciples are seen here in this text. And then Jesus said unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? He fed multitudes of people with physical food. He fed 5,000. He fed 4,000. But as he continued to try to feed them what they truly needed, spiritual food, spiritual meat, the teachings of Jesus, the faith, they left him. They went back to their other things. And he looks to his disciples, and I can't help but almost hear a, a crackle in his voice as he says this. The emotion maybe that was behind it. Did it go away? Lord, to whom shall we go? Peter says. You have the words of eternal life. Peter said... We choose to be devoted to you because you have the words of eternal life. They go looking for some more physical food somewhere or some physical cravings that they have. They don't want these spiritual things. But we understand, Jesus, the covenant that you came to establish with mankind. We want to be part of that. We consent to that. Lord, to whom shall we go? Because you have the words of eternal life. But to go back to the text again in Psalm 63. And not only did he say, oh God, thou art my God. He says, early will I see thee. Early denotes an idea of having a fear of missing God. I used an illustration that I used in the first sermon talking about the early academic days of Mary. I wasn't overly concerned about missing the bus, let's just say. Why? Because that was the thing that was going to take me to that place where I had to study and learn and I didn't want to be there. It wasn't a big deal to miss that bus. But if the family says, we're going on vacation and we're going to leave at 3 o'clock in the morning, I may get up at 12 o'clock because I don't want to miss that. You understand the same you can relate in some other way, some other maybe more important way than that silly illustration that I made. But the idea is still the same here. Early will I see thee as a fear of missing. I don't want to miss it. I don't want to be caught off guard. It's easy to do. Even his disciples did this when they were in the garden with Jesus. He says, you stay and watch here as I go yonder and pray. He went to pray. He comes back and they're sleeping. They had no thought or concept in their mind that they might miss Jesus. They really didn't grasp at that moment that in just a few short moments in the future that Jesus is going to be taken and they're never going to see Him in that same sense again. Now that, that's real. They did see Him. They walked with Him 40 days after the resurrection. They walked. I understand that. But they would never see Him again in the exact same way that they were with Him that night in the garden. That they were with Him that night at that last supper. And think about Judas as he was there fellowshipping with Jesus and the disciples, knowing in his mind and Jesus telling him that thou do, do as quickly. Never again. Maybe in that same position. Early will I seek thee. I don't, I don't want to miss Jesus. I don't want that fear of missing him. But then the earnesty in this as well. 
back to the text. I seek thee as a soul that thirsteth for thee as in a dry land. Thinking about that. This earnestness. The whole being is affected in this situation, isn't it? He's talking about his thirst. He's talking about his vision. We'll talk about in a few moments. The the hungering. His whole being is affected. When I think about Hebrews eleven six. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he that cometh unto God must, that's important, but must believe that he is. Absolutely. Clearly. Yes, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. But not only that. If you're going to be pleasing in God's sight, there's more to it than just acknowledging that he exists. He's a rewarder of them that what? Diligently. That's earnestness. Diligently seek. Diligently seek him. Honestly. Inventory your past week. Just just you you inventory yours, I inventory mine. How much time in that week? But then I'm not talking take take Sunday, last Sunday out, take Wednesday night out. Just last week, other than those two times, how much of your time was actively spent in seeking the Lord? I can't answer that. How would I measure up in my devotion to God with the psalmist in Psalm 16? He says, verse 4, though, there's an eternal here. Verse 4 says, Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. While I live, he's reasoned. The reason why I live is because of him. This lifelong pursuit that I have of him. I'm going to keep this as long as I live. Now, the spiritual mind of us understands that we're going to go beyond this physical life and we get to bless him and praise him and all of those things in heaven if we're faithful to him here but go back again and emphasize the living that we're talking about is on time side of eternity the child of God lives better than life because the child of God continually not just when it's time to come to the church house the child of God lives a continual life of devotion to his God and so as we move on looking at verses 3 and 4 there's also an appreciation. Ingratitude, and I mentioned that this morning in the first sermon as well, but ingratitude in Romans chapter 1, we've been starting in around verse 20 and continue reading, ingratitude comes into play. They didn't retain God in their thoughts, in their minds. God gave them over to reprobate minds. I understand that, but one of the things that was caused behind that is they weren't thankful. Isn't ingratitude just a disgusting when you put forth effort, you put something into doing something for someone and a nice gift that maybe it costs a lot of money or, or you make something, you do something for somebody and, and they don't appreciate that. It hurts, doesn't it? But again, I go back to what was the greatest gift ever given? And I, and I second what, what Nick said this morning at the end of our first service. What a blessing it was to be here for that service. But Eddie, you did a fabulous job passion is there, the clarity of it, the knowledge, it was a great job. It was perfect for us to repair our minds for the I appreciate it. I appreciate seeing God's people doing what God's people are supposed to do. Amen? It's, it's nice to be recognized for those things. God needs to be recognized first and foremost. Look at verse 3. He says, Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Your loving kindness is better than life. Now, you can't convince the average American that God's loving kindness is better than their life. Some people, maybe a little easier than others, but all the comforts in life, the health, the wealth, the prosperity, the spiritual life is better than all of that. I've seen people and knocked on doors of people whose houses were immaculate, which means they have a lot of money and they're not worried about money and things of this nature. They're just miserable and wouldn't invite you in to talk about God's Word. And I've been to shacks, places with holes in the floor, and slums where they would say, I, I want to study God's Word. I love the Lord. I need the Lord. I 
that's not always the case. You can flip the switch and find the opposite truth as well. I understand that. But spiritual life, there's no comparison. It's always going to be a better life than just the temporal one. Why? Because in the very nature of the words themselves, eternal versus temporal, this doesn't last. Have you ever heard that phrase, he wants his cake and wants to eat it too? You do understand the concept behind that. You can have a cake, but when you eat it, it's gone. You want it to never end? I can understand that. Some cakes are like that. That's great. You want to take your time. I eat like a Marine. And I have to sometimes say, this is too good to eat that fast. Slow down. Enjoy it. Why? Because it's going to be gone. That's what life is, physically speaking. All the accolades and all the things were so important when you were in high school. Those who are in college now, they weren't as important as the college years, were they? And those of you who've gone beyond college years, now you're in adulthood, those things that you were concerned about in college, not as important as they are now, were they? You're so vested in those physical things that are temporal, that are only here for a moment, and invest so much in them. Sometimes eternity we invest in those things, sadly. The spiritual life is always always better than the temporal life because it's an eternal life. This has been said, it's better to die a thousand times in God's favor than to live in His wrath. I don't, I, I, it's easy to say in an air-conditioned, padded pew assembly hall such as this, but do we really believe that? Is that genuine for me that it is better to die a thousand times than in God's favor than to live in his wrath. Hebrews 10, 31, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. I think we've, we've lost that sometimes. We, we need to preach, we need to emphasize the love of Christ, the love of God, the, the grace of God, the mercy of God, but it does not take away, church, it does not, never will take away the wrath of God. It's just as real. It's just as powerful. It's just on the other side of faithfulness. Yes, we can be faithful. Yes, we can hear him say, well done. Yes, we can marvel in the love and grace of God. But he's not just going to overlook your sin if you're not willing to do it. He's not going to overlook very sin because he decided to preach the word. The only way he's going to overlook my sins is if I turn them over to him in repentance. Cast those cares upon him. It still is a fearful thing to fall into the hand of the living God. And of course, Hebrews 10, 31 is talking about in that negative sense. Physical life is consumed with praise. That's what he's saying in this passage. Verse 4, Thus will I bless thee while I live. I'm consumed with blessing the name of Jesus. How often does Jesus get a word in in your conversations outside of the church building? thought about that? When you're talking with your co-workers, your friends, does Jesus ever get to come up? Is my life truly consumed with praise? Again, verse 1 he references his flesh. I will seek as my soul search, my flesh longs for thee. Like it's dying of thirst, my soul, my flesh longs for thee. But he goes on in verse 2 and talks about his eyes. To see thy power, thy glory, as so as I have seen in thy sanctuary. I want to see, I want to lay eyes upon him. It reminds me of a song in our song books. Oh, I want to see him. Look upon his face. There to sing forever of his saving grace. On the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. Cares all past, home at last, whatever to me. I want to what? See him. My eyes long to see him. Then again in verse 3, my lips shall praise thee. I can't sing your songs of praise to God for you. I can only sing for myself. My lips do this. I think back to the Hebrew letter as well where he says, Jesus says in the midst of the church, well I sing praise. In the midst of us, what a blessing it is to come together and blend our voices in praise to God, but it's an individual thing as well that I must be doing with the right spirit and with the right attitude as well. Truth in spirit. John chapter 4, verse 24. The 
then there's the verse 4 that says his hands. I will lift up my hands in thy name. And, and it's interesting when you think about and you look for images and things of worship in our current culture today, you'll, you'll be hard pressed not to find some image of somebody's hands doing this. And this is, I'm praising God. Can't you tell I'm praising God? Does that mean to you that I'm praising God? It may mean, hey, look out. Trust me, if you see me doing this, next thing's probably going to come is get down. There's danger, okay? That's a warning. Hey, or look at me. Are you saying it's a sin to raise your hand? I'm not saying that. I'm saying there's more to what the Bible talks about in lifting up our hands than just raising your hands and saying hallelujah God. Hands most often in Scripture reference an action that you're doing. When I give you a cup of cold water in the name of the Lord for your need, I'm lifting up my hands to God. When I lift up my hand to help you out of a difficult situation, an action that I'm doing, I'm lifting up my hands to God. That's more of the idea. But he says my hands are involved. The actions, physical life itself is concerned with God. One very godly person that I know who has given his life to ministry and mission work, you will not talk, no one will talk to that man long at all without Jesus coming out. If you're sitting beside him, if you happen to have been beside him, I don't think he's traveling as much anymore now. He's getting old. If you were to sit beside him on an airplane, it doesn't matter where you're from doesn't matter what your background is, atheist, Buddhist, Muslim, he didn't care. Jesus is coming up. Why? Because his whole life was lived in appreciation for what God had done for him. And he wanted others to see that as well. How do you feel around someone like that? How do I feel around someone who's very spiritually minded? Do we sometimes treat it kind of like maybe you did when you were younger and you did something wrong and you were afraid dad found out about it so you want to keep as much distance from dad as possible? See, there's a big difference in, in mom and dad when you're doing what's right and when you're doing what's wrong, isn't there? Can't wait to give me a hug, you know. And, and young people, just go ahead and understand this. When you come out, hi, mom, you're the f in the world. We know. Hi, Dad. There's not a better dad on the planet than you. What did you do? We know. It's got to be genuine. It's got to be genuine. How do we feel around someone spiritually minded? Does it cause us to maybe to, you know, I'm, I just, I really don't, I don't like to talk about Bible things too much. You know, I don't, I don't want to push the Bible too much on people, and they think I'm a, one of those radicals. I recall in the New Testament the common word on the street about Christians was that they were radicals. That's those people that turn the world upside down. It would be hard pressed in many cases to find the world to be able to tell any difference in the average Christian in them today. Talk like they do. Watch what they watch. Go where they go. Do what they do. Wear what they wear. Does your life show up? God, our culture. How do we feel around someone spiritually minded? Number next. What about verse 5? There's satisfaction in God. You see, the world, the culture of the world, it offers what the Rolling Stone said long ago. I can't get no things. But the Christian gets it all the time. He lives it. Look at verse 5. My soul shall be satisfied with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. What is being satisfied is not the carnal, the flesh, the outside. What's being satisfied is the inner man, the soul. It's from within. My soul shall be satisfied. Philippians chapter 4, verse 11. Paul was in prison. He'd been shipwrecked. He's whipped. He's stoned. He's hungry. He's thirsty. Yet he says these words, as you see on the screen. Not that I speak in respect of want. I'm not saying that I don't have anything. I, yeah, I've had all these things happen in my past, but I'm not saying that I'm living in want. 
For I have learned. If you mark your Bibles, I would underline those phrases. That phrase there, I have learned. It wasn't natural. Contentment for the average human being is not normal. That's what he's saying. But I've learned that whatever state I am, there with be content. Whatever state I'm in, I've learned to be content with that. So that's the within. But then in the same verse, in verse 5, he goes to without. He says, my mouth will praise thee. You see, I don't have to voice words verbally for God to hear me, do I? I can, I can say a prayer. When we were led in prayer, we were led in prayer this morning several times. Every time we're led in prayer, I'm praying along with that one we need in prayer. But I'm not saying it out loud. God doesn't have to hear the words come out of my mouth to know what I'm thinking or what I'm saying. But if I do use my mouth to praise Him, I can't hide that from you either. I'm not supposed to. I'm not doing it to be seen of you. But you're going to see me when I do. There's there's certain people that I can't wait and I long see them up leading singing. I long to hear them lead a prayer. I long to hear them preach a sermon. I long to hear them. I'm looking forward to the next devotional that you want to hear. I look forward to those moments. Hearing them praising God. And I want to do the same as well. The satisfaction brings the satisfaction to myself though when I'm doing this from within and then it goes without. If I just do it within, I'm never going to be satisfied with that. I'm not going to find that satisfaction with God because I'm just holding it in, I'm bottling it in, I'm never willing to turn that over to Him. And I'm reminded of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33. If you will not confess me before men, I will not confess you before my Father which is in heaven. If you will confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father which is in heaven. That's in essence what He's saying. I'm paraphrasing. You do realize, don't you, how easy it is to deny the Lord. To deny Him is, you don't have to go out here and say, I renounce Jesus Christ before this audience. To deny Him is to simply not do what you're supposed to do in service to Him as a child of His. That's in the worship, yes, but that's also at work, at school, at play, wherever you are. Don't be ashamed of Jesus not ashamed of you. Whatever is in the heart is eventually going to come out of the heart. It's not that which goes into the body which defiles and that food and things of that nature. It's which, what comes out of the heart. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. I'm recalling Jesus would say as a as that same idea that there were certain people, and he said, how can you being evil speak good things? How, how is it possible for you to speak good things? It's, it's like, a, it's like a, a bad tree giving forth good fruit. See, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart brings forth good things. An evil man out of the evil treasure of the heart brings forth evil things. But I say also unto thee, every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account there every day of judgment. And so what goes into the heart leads us to our next point. Verse 6, meditation. Meditation on God's Word. He goes on and says in verse 6, When I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches. What's he doing? He's praising Him. He's praising Him with his whole body. Even when he lies down at night, I remember thee. On my bed. I meditate upon him. I meditate. I remember when I'm lying down at night to rest and go to sleep. The last thoughts that are going to be on my mind are going to be that God, can I sing that? I can say that thankfully is what the do. I need to do better with that. I've heard of people before talking about it. I, I just quit praying at night before I went to sleep because I found myself falling asleep in the middle of the prayer and I just can't be right. What better way to go to sleep? 
do you love your child any less? That child's talking to you, and you're sitting there rocking, and they're talking to you, and they're saying something about their day and how much they love you and appreciate you, and before they get it all out, they fall asleep. Do you stop loving them? Oh. So um, upon my bed, I remember you. I remember you when I meditate upon the night watches. The night watches, man, thoughtless and restless. Our thoughts cause us to have these restless nights, but sometimes that restlessness can be a good thing. There's a difference. I know we need our sleep. I understand that. Don't get me wrong. I understand that. But there's a difference in having troubles that go through your mind that keep you up at night and cause you to toss and turn. There's a difference in that and having good thoughts that are keeping you up and so forth. You wake up differently from those, don't you? You're still tired, yes, but it's a different, different mindset. Do we have those restless thoughts of God? What are the night watches? The night watches, it's a military term. It has an idea of, of being a guard. When I'm on guard, my thoughts are on you. <laughs> that makes sense. Totally, it makes sense that when, when things might, I might be facing some very hard, difficult temptation that I need to be thinking about God just when the temptation, the hardships come. We started earlier in the night when I pillow my head. That's when you're in the safety and the comfort of your own home. I'm thinking of him. So I think of him in the good. I think of him in the bad. I think of him always. The night watches. I do what I meditate. Jesus told his disciples, Matthew 26, verse 41, watch and pray. That's another song we sometimes sing, isn't it? That's on that file. Watch and pray for the Lord is coming, coming in the clouds someday. Watch, be vigilant, knowledgeable, and pray. Commune with Him. And He said that in the context of the Spirit indeed is willing. Flesh. Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. When's the last time you actually earnestly asked God to deliver you from temptation? Sometimes, you know, sometimes we, we put that in the context of, well, that's, that's what addicts do. That's someone who has a real problem. Brothers and sisters, sin is a real problem to every member of this congregation and every congregation and every soul that has walked this earth. Sin is a problem. Your sin is a problem. My sin is a problem. I need to be praying more earnestly. I'm going to go ahead and say it right now in front of all of you. I need to do a better job at this. Watching and praying. But understand how foolish it is to say, Lord, lead me not into temptation, as is said in the model prayer, and put yourself in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Try not to let us do. Put yourself right in the middle of something you know is immoral and say, I'm going to be all right because I prayed about this. You're not being watchful. There are certain places, things that we as God's children must avoid. And we're not going to know that if we're not meditating on the Word of God enough. Average Christian. The average Christian can tell you so much more about pop culture than they can about God's Word. That, brothers and sisters, is a fact. It also affects preachers, elders, deacons, fathers, mothers, Bible class teachers. We're all in this together. We need more faith comes by and hearing by that's the only way you're going to get it that's the hear me brothers and sisters and friends the only way you're going to get it by the word of God Jesus told his disciples here's the word of God telling his disciples watch Paul told the Philippian brethren, think on these things. 
and he gives you a list. When you start struggling with some things and you start having these thoughts that are reoccurring and it's just rolling around in your mind and you're, is this okay? Is this good? Should I do this? Should I not do this? Can I be this, do this as a child of God? Can I be part of this group as a child of God? Can I go to this movie as a child of God? Can I, whatever it may be, go back and look at that list in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8 and see, does that plug into any one of those outlets? Does it fit? No. That's not, that's not how this works. Make sure it plugs into all of those outlets. And dwell upon that in your thought process. See if it does change some things for you. Think, literally, meditate upon these things. So in conclusion, looking at Psalm 63. We love the Lord this much as the psalmist is saying. We love the Lord this much. How much are we going to pray to Him? We love the Lord this much. How much are we going to listen to Him? We love the Lord this much. How much are we going to speak of Him? Now notice I said of Him, not to Him. We love the Lord this much. How will it change us, including our thoughts and our work? If He said, repent and be baptized, would we? He did. He was willing to do it himself first. When he came to John to be baptized of John, John said, I have need to be baptized of thee and comest thou unto me. He said, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it become of us to fulfill all righteousness. And he suffered him and he baptized him. That was Jesus. He said, Repent and be baptized. Did we do that? Did we do that? He says, Be faithful unto death, would we? He did. He did that. He was faithful to his God all the way up to the cross. Not just any death, the death of a cross. He did that for you. He did that for me. So that I can live as a child of his, not just anybody. I can live as a child of God better than life. How's your life? Is it just as good as the average classmate, co-worker, cousin, family member? Or is it better than life? Have you sanctified the Lord God in your heart? Are you ready to give a, an answer to every man that asks you a reason to hope that is in you? If not, we're going to sing a song of encouragement, an opportunity to be a faithful child of God. If we can help in any way. That's what we want. To do. We want to assist. I want to show forth in my life a better than life. I want you to show forth to the world and to me. And help me as well. I see you living faithful. I see. We had two precious souls come forward this morning encouraging and motivating you. I want, I want you to live better than life. I want you to help me live better than life. And I can't do that without Jesus the Christ. Nor can you. Are you ready to come to him right now as we stand and sing?